God is alive and he is working in the hearts of his people and in this world. Um, I just want to remind you this morning that no matter who you are, what you did this week, what you said this week, what you looked at this week, I want you to know that there is a good God who loves you and has a plan for your life. And I say that because I don't know if you've heard that this week. <laughs> I, I doubt your boss called you up this week and, and, and told you those words. I doubt your kids screamed at you in the night, woke you up at 3 a.m. to call you in to remind you that you've got a God who loves you and who has a plan for your life. And so I, I just, I, I wanna be maybe just the only person this week who reminds you of that truth this morning. God is here and he is here to speak. And part of the way that we listen and part of the way that we obey is we sit under his word. And that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna open up the word of God and we're gonna listen and we're gonna respond to the wisdom and truth and power that is in it this morning. And so hope that you're able to do that this morning with me as well. We are in a series uh, through Genesis in which we're kind of going through the book of Genesis and I've really enjoyed it. I've really loved going through this book. I see Genesis as kind of like our origin story for lack of a better word. Like I, I feel like in, in our popular culture, origin stories have become like more and more popular. You know, part of that is like Disney and Marvel, all those people doing all the spinoffs and the prequels and the origin stories. And part of that reason is because they are just milking this money machine that they got, but also because we're kind of fascinated with the origin story, right? It's like Corella DeVille, why is she so cruel? Let's look into that a little bit, right? Or some of these other origin stories, right? Why is the Joker the way that he is? Let's delve into a little bit of his history because your origin story matters. And I see Genesis as kind of our origin story. And that's the way I want us to see it this morning. This isn't just a story of an ancient people who are not connected with us at all. This is part of our story of humanity, of humans, and how we've responded to God's calling on our life. So just a quick recap of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, God creates the world, um, and he creates it good, very good. He creates humanity. He loves them. He gives them a place to live, and he gives them a calling. But then in chapter 3, humanity has a choice between good and evil, and they choose evil and turn away from God. And the rest of the Bible is kind of how God is fixing and addressing our failure to follow him in life. And then Genesis 4 through 5, if you've ever read these chapters, I call Genesis 4 and 5 the descent of humanity into darkness. It is the descent into darkness. And we're going to get into how dark the world actually became in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about a sobering but also a very hope-filled topic. And stick with me because it is hope-filled. But I've entitled my sermon this morning, Why God Destroyed the World. Um, aren't you glad you're here this morning? Because I'm going to explain uh, why this story is in the Bible and why it's so important for us and our faith. If I had to list probably the three Bible stories that every person in America knows, Noah and the ark uh, are always going to make that list, right? Everyone knows the story of Noah and the ark in some capacity. In fact, uh, they even made a movie about the story. And I think I have a, a picture uh, so this is uh, Russell Crowe, who's one of my like favorite actors of all time. Gladiator is my favorite movie of all time. And uh, he made a movie uh, called Noah. And uh, I, I look at this picture and I'm like, this movie, if you've ever seen it, it's basically Gladiator on water. You know, it's like Disney on ice. This movie is like Gladiator on water. In fact, even the picture of this one looks a lot like the Gladiator cover. And so there is a lot of poetic license in this movie, but I love how one reviewer rated the movie. Let's put his review up here. Uh, he says, it is wonderfully discomforting. <laughs> it's like, thank you, Higgs Bawson, uh, for articulating how we all feel about this story. He's not a professional critic. He's just some guy on Google that I found. Um, and I love that review. This story is wonderfully discomforting. 
And maybe you feel some of that tension with me this morning. I think a lot of times when people approach the story, they kind of approach it one of two ways. They simplify it in kind of one of two ways. One is they treat this story as like a cute little story about animals, right? And, and my son has a puzzle uh, that we just got for him and it's Noah and the Ark and it's a cool puzzle and we're using it to teach him about the animals. You know, it's like, here's a dolphin, here's a shark and oh, here's the panda bear and the lions. They're right next to each other. And uh, the whole puzzle is just that arc. And as I'm putting together the puzzle with him, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, but all around them, humanity is being destroyed, but I'm just going to focus on this lion right now, right? And so that's what happens a lot of times in Christian world. We kind of sanitize the story and we focus just on this cute little story about Noah and this boat and these animals. And we don't think about kind of the other part. But then I feel like there's people in the world, I call them maybe like the angry atheist, who looks at stories like this and say, look, see, God's not a loving God. Look what God did. That's not a God worthy of worship. And they simplify the story down about God's judgment, not even taking into context that in this story, God judges, but God also saves. They don't do a true justice to the story and they limit and focus on just what they want to. This story reveals a God who is both just and merciful. The story is very complex and it's important for our faith. It teaches us a lot about God, about humanity, about our failure, about justice, about grace, and about the mercy of God. And so I want us to see this story not as like ancient history disconnected from us, but as a part of our story as humans and how we have to wrestle with our faith and our failure to live up to God's design for us in this world. So it's an important story for us and one that I think that we need to, to, to read and to address. So on that note, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 5. And if you're able to and willing, I'd love to invite you to stand with me as we read uh, the word of God here this morning. We're in Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 5. I'll give you a second to turn there. This is your history. This is my history. This is a chapter in the story of humanity. Verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubic above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. Verse 17, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into it and to keep them alive." And to take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. This is the key verse this morning. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Amen. This is God's word. You can be seated at this time. Before we get any further, 
I just want to remind us that this is not mythology. This is not mythology. This is not an allegorical story with a point. This is narrative. This is history. Jesus references Noah as an actual man and the time period of Noah as an actual time period. And even the story itself doesn't read like an allegory. We're talking about measurements. We're talking about generations. We're talking about people and a time period. This is historical narrative. And I just want us to say that up front this morning, because if you treat this story as an allegory or just as a simple story with a point, you're going to miss the point of the story and the gravity of what God is doing in this story. So that's the first thing we got to wrestle with this morning, that this is a true biblical historical historical narrative of mankind's failure and God's demonstration of grace to a man named Noah and his family, and by extension, all of us. So two common objections to the flood. I was thinking about this story, and I feel like I got to kind of hit on these a little bit. We don't have a lot of time to hit on all these, but I want to hit on them just a little bit. And uh, two common objections to the flood. Number one is the science, right? I can't get past the science of how you could even build an ark this large. How do you fit all these animals on the ark? Uh, I love what one, y'all have ever heard the website Quora before? You ask questions on Google, right? And people answer those questions. And one person's question on uh, Quora was how much poop would that many animals produce daily? And then part two of the question is whose chore was it to scoop all of that up, uh, right? So that, you know, these questions come up, how many animals, like how did they come? Did Noah whistle? And then all the animals came, right? So there's a lot of questions about the science for the story. And so I'll I'll approach this one of two ways. Number one, uh, there was actually a study done by some students and it was reported in the Smithsonian. So not even a, a Christian magazine, kind of a secular science magazine. And the title of the article was, could Noah's Ark float in theory Yes. And uh, the whole article is about how the dimensions and all that stuff, and they run it through uh, computer models, and they found that, yes, this boat would float according to the dimensions that were given in the Bible. And then the other question the article addresses is, well, how many animals could fit on there? And uh, this is a direct quote from uh, the article. It says, scientists have characterized about 1.7 million species to date. So the students argue that if the average mass of species represented on the ark was the average mass of sheep, the ark would theoretically have been able to accommodate them all without capsizing. And I feel like sometimes when people think about how do you fit all these animals on the boat, we, we think that like the whole boat is filled with elephants. I'm like, think a little bit. Like most animals are small. It's like, think, most animals are small, right? There's some big animals, but most of them are small. So theoretically, yes, this could happen, and it did happen. The other thing I'd say, just with, with humility, if you're kind of hung up on the science, and you're like, how could this all work? Like, can I just remind us, it's going to sound dumb, like six chapters ago, an eternal God who has always existed created the world with his voice. So like, God can do the science. God can figure out the science, right? And so I don't want us to get hung up on that. And sometimes I feel like people get hung up on the science and they ignore the story because of that. And I want to remind us that science does not keep us from reckoning with our moral history. And that's what this story is doing. It is causing us to reckon with our moral history and failures as humans. And we can't hide behind the science and forget the point or address the point of the story. Number two objection is I can't get past the judgment. How could God do this? Or, or maybe I hear some people say, man, I, I really don't like the God of the Old Testament. I like the New Testament God. He, he's cool. I can get down with him, but I can't get down with the God of the Old Testament. And I want to remind us this morning, in case it's unclear, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Same God. Same love, same plans, same concerns with sin and brokenness. It's the same God working the same purpose for us and for his glory. And so I want to clear that up this morning, that it is the same God who has the same right to judge, to forgive, and to place mercy on because he is the creator. I love how everyone objects to judgment, but no one objects to mercy, (laughs) Everyone objects when God judges, like, God, you can't do that. But no one objects when God overlooks sin and gives us mercy. We're we're cool with that. 
but we don't like the judgment part. And so I want to talk about that a little bit this morning and why maybe we're kind of off in our approach to our own sin and brokenness and to the brokenness of sin in the world. Look at verses five and six here this morning. It says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only continually evil. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved his heart. Lesson number one from the story, the flood shows us that sin is way worse than we think it is. Sin is way worse than we think it is. We're used to normalizing sin. We're used to rationalizing sin. We're used to glorifying sin. And I feel like we don't recognize the gravity of what it does and its impact on souls and on this world. We're shocked and appalled by God's response to the wicked world of Noah, but we don't think about how God was responding to the sin in the world. And that if God responded in such a way to the sin, how great and how deep and how terrible is the sin of the world that would cause this response of God? It's like we give the people in this time period a benefit of the doubt, but we don't give God the benefit of the doubt. The severity of God's judgment is at least proportional to the severity of the sin that he addresses in this story. Why did God destroy the world or destroy the earth? Part of it is that we had already destroyed the earth. It's a world of violence, a world of corruption, a world of sexual perversion, These were terrible times. And just a few chapters ago, God called humanity to flourish, be fruitful on the earth, and be his image bearers. And how far had humanity come from God's call for them on their life? God did destroy the earth, but before he did that, we destroyed it. Humanity destroyed it and God's purpose for it. Let me give you just a quick illustration. Um, a few years ago, my uh, wife and I, and we had a one-year-old son at the time, or a little bit between one and two, uh, we were at a park one day and it was an Arbor Day. And uh, I'm not much of a planter myself, um, but they were giving away free trees uh, at this park. And so we thought, you know what? We don't have a tree in our front yard. And so, hey, let's get a tree and we can plant it with our son. And then, you know, 30 years from now, you know, when we hand the house down or whatever, he can play in that tree that we planted together or whatever his kids can play. And so we got this tree and uh, we, we put it in the front yard and it's been there over the past few years. Now, one thing I've noticed about this tree is that it has not grown in the past two years. (laughs) And we water it. (laughs) We play around it. I took pictures with my son in front of it. (laughs) And the other day, I finally went up to it and I snapped a branch off. That thing has been dead for about two years. (laughs) And maybe there was a freeze or whatever. So there's been a tree in my front yard that's just been dead. And I'm here having, glo- you know, like thoughts that one day my son is going to climb <laughs> in it. I guess here's the spiritual point. Like breath is not the only indicator of life. Breath is not the only indicator of life. That spiritually speaking, we can be spiritually dead, but still be alive. And when God looked down on the world, he saw a world that was so far from his vision, his purpose, his plan, so far from a world that is for the good of humanity that he had to step in and address it. Think about it. Six chapters ago, God created a very good world. It takes a lot to impress God. Very good world. Three chapters in, humanity falls. Four chapters in, the first murder takes place. Six chapters in and every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. That's God's critique of the world of this time. A world with sexual perversion, violence everywhere, everything corrupt. God loves his creation too much to let it persist in wickedness. And God loves his glory too much for him to allow us to go on in wickedness unpunished. God feels the weight of sin, 
And for anyone in here who says, man, judgment, God's judgment, judgment kind of bothers me. I don't really like judgment. It makes me uncomfortable. Like how much more so do you think God, judgment bothers God or how deeply God feels judgment as he has to discipline and punish the humanity who he loves and who he created. This, this passage says that God is literally heartbroken over the sin of the world. It says he regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And the amazing thing about God's love is God knew that this was going to happen and yet he created us anyway. Like why would God create a world he knew would fall apart? This reveals the depth of God's love for us, not just in this time, but for us in our time. And I was talking to uh, Pastor John the other day, and we were talking about how, like, kind of in our culture, we don't like to commit. Like, you know, it's like we like to do test runs of relationships and test runs of churches and test runs of people and jobs and all that kind of stuff. We don't like to commit to things. But God committed to humanity knowing that this was going to happen. God is loving and desires us to know that this was going to cost him up front, and yet he still creates us knowing that this was going to happen. God feels the weight of sin. Sin grieves God because God knows sin holds us back and it holds the world back. God knows that all the energy that we put into disobedience could be put into doing amazing things like facilitating a world after the image of God, growing in love, growing in holiness. And God knows that sin is a waste of time that just keeps us from doing what we're called to do. The story reminds us that sin is way worse than we think it is. We take our sin way too lightly, and therefore it persists. We do three things with sin. We rationalize, we normalize, and then we glorify. But God has three responses to sin. Number one, grief. God grieves over our sin and over the brokenness of this world. That's his love. It's, it's personal. God is not just a, a separate deity who looks on the world that he created and then turns and does something else. He is intimately involved with this world. Number two, God responds to sin with righteousness. We want him to do that. We want God to be just. And God responded here with righteousness. The wrong must be addressed. The world is dead. It needs a new beginning. And then number three, God always responds to sin with an extension and an offering of mercy and grace. Look at verse eight. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And then there's this man named Noah that God singles out, and God says to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Verse 14, but make yourself an ark of of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. So the flood shows us that sin is way worse than we think it is, but it also shows us that grace is far better than we think it is. And when you think about God, like God has total freedom over his creation. He can do whatever he wants. Like he can do whatever he wants. He's the king, he's the Lord, he's on the throne. So the idea that God hates sin and that we all sin, but that God would provide a way for a man and his family to be saved through this event, or that God would provide a way for us to be saved even though we have sinned against him, just points to the amazing goodness and grace of who he is. This man is singled out, not because he's perfect. Like the point of the story is not there was a whole bunch of bad people, Noah's a good guy, so he got to go on the ark. The point of the story is that we are all evil, we all sin, but that Noah was a man who walked with God, who trusted God, who had faith in God. And it was that faith that God saw and used for his grace. Noah wasn't perfect. He deserved the flood, but he got the ark. And in the same way, we are not perfect. We deserve the flood, but we get Jesus. We're all sinners. 
And sin is a weight that will sink you in this life and sink you in the life to come. And God's grace is inviting us to let go of that sin and walk into his goodness. I wonder how so many of us take for granted the grace that God gives us in our lives. So many things he protects us from, so many good things that he gives us, and we take it for granted. Grace is far better than we think it is. The story goes on, and uh, God gives Noah the dimensions of the ark and how it's supposed to be built, and he tells him specifically, it's very specific, how to build this ark. And he says, you're going to do it this way, you're going to build it this way, I will establish my covenant with you. And then he invites them uh, to build it, and when the time comes, he says, get on the ark because I'm going to flood the earth. And uh, this is where I kind of want to hit, uh, take the story home and bring it to us because I feel like if there's one application of this story, one application of the story, um, it's going to seem so simple. You, you might laugh, but man, it is so deep and profound. And this morning, if you're taking notes or if you're not taking notes, this is what I want you to do. This is the response to the story. And the response of the story is four words. Get on the boat. Get on the boat. (laughs) That's the point of the story. Get on the boat. And in Noah's time, that boat was this ark that he built. And in our time, God has given us a better boat, which is Jesus Christ. Get on the boat. This world is about to be destroyed. And God says, get on the boat. What saved Noah? It wasn't the boat itself. It was the provision that God provided for him. The only thing that would withstand this storm was the ark. And God knew that and gave him the exact specifications for how to build it so that he could survive it. And in the same way, in our life, God knows that the only way to abundant life, the only way out of this sin mess that we make of our lives is Jesus Christ. And the exact specifications of an abundant life is following Jesus. Like we see this, these details in the story about how you should build it with 300 cubits and build it this high. And it feels like kind of like a side detail. But what if, in fact, this is pointing to the fact that God told Noah exactly how to build his, this boat. And God is telling us exactly how to build our life. God tells us how to build our marriage. God tells us how to build our family. God tells us how to parent our children. God tells us how to handle the tough moments of life. God tells us how to be fulfilled. Even death, God has given us the dimensions to make our last day, not our worst day, but our best day. And that's pretty amazing to think about. It's all here in the word. Noah wasn't a perfect man, but he was a man of faith living in a corrupt generation. And we're called to be the exact same thing. Four times in this passage, the writer repeats the phrase, and Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. He walked with God in a very corrupt day. Feels like a very corrupt day in our time period, doesn't it? I went on a, like CNN, or it wasn't CNN, it was like some news aggregator, and I looked at the top 10 stories, and the top 10 stories, like news stories in the world were War, shootings, theft, sexual violence, and things like that. Famine, other bad things happening. And I thought, man, I wonder what the headlines of Noah's day would have been like. And I bet they would have been very similar. But Noah was a man who walked with God. The amazing thing about Noah, and Hebrews chapter 7 actually points this out, it says that uh, in reverent fear, Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And it says he was warned by God concerning events unseen. Noah built the ark before there was a reason to build the ark. Noah trusted God before he was able to see the reason why God told him to build the ark. And in the same way in our life, we are called to obey God even before we understand why God is calling us to obey him or why he's calling us to do something. We're called to trust and obey him. Lest we forget, Noah built a giant ship in the desert. (laughs) How crazy he must have looked to the people around him. 
how crazy it must look to follow Jesus in the world that we live in. We're called to trust and obey in the midst of this world, in the midst of skeptics, in the midst of the people who ridicule us in this corrupt generation. We're called to be a people who trust. Noah was also a man who led his family. I love how this it says Noah was a righteous man, it said nothing about his family. But because of Noah's righteousness, his wife, his sons, and his sons' wives were brought onto the boat as well. A special call for men in this room. Where you go, your family goes. You have incredible responsibility over your household and the ability to allow it to flourish in a kingdom of love and grace under the lordship of Christ. Do you have the ability to do that? Noah was a man of faith. And Noah built the boat before the storm. Build your life on Jesus before the storm. Like a lot of people, they come to Jesus during the storm and there's nothing wrong with that. Like he's always there to offer an extension and a life raft for us. But he also invites us to follow him before the storm to build the ark before the storm, to build our life on Jesus before the storm. And we're called to do that, even when people mock, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's difficult to persevere. A few more things, then we'll close. Uh, you know, earlier we were talking about <laughs> kind of the animals and how do you clean up after the animals. And uh, I still think about that. Um, probably be thinking about that at lunch today. But um, I, I was thinking about the fact that like someone had to do that, right? It got me thinking about, there were a lot of chores probably on the boat, a lot of things to do on the boat. They weren't just chilling and sitting there on the boat. They were doing things, right? They were serving one another. They were worshiping the Lord. Uh, they were taking care of their families. They were taking care of the animals. And it got me thinking about, man, it, as you follow Jesus and as I invite you to get on the boat with him, don't just ride on the boat. Don't just ride on the boat. <laughs> Sit by the window, look out the window. It's like a cruise, you know, it's like, this is like life is my cruise, church is my cruise on my way to heaven. We're called to live and work, do ministry together, love one another. This isn't a cruise ship. A lot of ministry happened on the ark. We're called to serve, to be a light, to invite other people onto the ship with us. Man, here at New Day, man, I, I had the privilege of kind of overseeing our teams and our groups and our ministries, and uh, I'll just be transparent. Our, all of our ministries are full. Our kids' ministry is full. Our groups are full. We're having to turn away people because we don't have enough group leaders, our groups. Everything's full. And for me, it's a reminder that as we're on this boat, as we follow Jesus, we're called to walk in his footsteps to serve others while we're on the boat not just treat it as a cruise ship on the way to heaven. Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And I have found that axiom to be true even in our day. Most people long to be ministered to, but God calls us to minister and to serve one, another's, one another. Get on the boat, but don't just ride the boat. Serve, administer, and worship, and love while you're on the boat. We draw to a close uh, this morning. Um, I love this image of a boat. And uh, actually, I'll give you a little insight into uh, Pastor John and I. We have this like kind of running inside joke that our, um, that our church building is like an old ship. And uh, in fact, if you look up, it even kind of looks like an ark in here. I wasn't really planning on that. It kind of looks like an ark. We call this the old ship. And it just got me thinking about, like, like, what are we doing here? What is church? Church is where we gather with one another to serve one another as we're floating and riding out the floods of this world and ultimately the flood of Jesus' return. In fact, Jesus talks about his return, and he says it in um, the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Uh, this is what he says. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. I didn't even plan it. We didn't even plan it this way, but this was in our reading this week. If you're doing our Bible reading, this was in the book of Matthew that we read this week. And the sad irony is that the same humanity that ignored the warnings of God through Noah is now ignoring the warnings of God through Jesus. I got two exhortations for you this morning. I'm going to reiterate them. Number one, like, to be saved from the storm, you need Jesus. You need to get on the boat. You don't get saved outside of the boat. You don't get saved watching the boat from afar. You get saved by getting on the boat. And for us this morning, for every single person, that is a personal relationship with Jesus in which we place our faith in him for the forgiveness of our sins. And if you have not done that, you are not on the boat. And I want you to be on the boat. You can do that very simply by just placing your faith in Jesus, by praying to him, calling out to him to save you. And every single person in this room needs to do that or you will perish. Number two, we need to serve one another when we're on the boat and when we get off the boat. At the end of our story, we didn't read it in this text, but at the end of our story, um, you know, the flood waters recede and the boat lands in a mountain range. And um, there's this moment, I like to picture this moment in which Noah and his family step onto dry ground and it's like a new beginning, a new beginning for the world, a new beginning for humanity and a new chance to do it differently. And that's how I see church. Like we are pioneers of an age to come, a new humanity, a new way of doing things, a way that is far different from a world that is busy competing against one another or canceling each other or fighting each other for the top spot. The church is someplace different. And we're called to be a new humanity, doing things differently. So that's my exhortation for any person who's already a follower of Jesus. is like, come do this differently with us. This is a new humanity sailing through the flood of this world, doing it differently. And the only difference between Noah's story and ours is that we get to invite as many people along with us as we are able to. And I want to invite you to do that today and every day. If you're on the boat, invite others into it and come do this with us.